If you're like me, your formal education in special relativity has been pretty lacking. I remember starting with the postulates of relativity and then moving on to a few of the direct consequences of these postulates like time dilation, length contraction, and the relativity of simultaneity. I also heard something about Minkowski space, but I remember being confused about how it works. From this description, I remember thinking that special relativity is just an annoying problem to deal with when speeds get too fast. However, as I started studying on my own, I realized that there are many mathematical techniques that make working with relativity much simpler, to the point that working with relativity seems simpler than not working with relativity. In this video, I will be presenting one of these techniques, spacetime algebra, which is the merging of geometric algebra with special relativity. Before I get into it, I want to mention that there are a few prerequisites for this video. First, you need to know the basics of special relativity, such as how the laws of physics and the speed of light are the same in all inertial reference frames and the equations for a Lorentz boost. If you haven't heard of Lorentz boosts before, most introductory textbooks incorrectly call them Lorentz transformations. The term Lorentz transformation actually refers to something that is much more general than Lorentz boosts and will be defined near the end of the video. While there is much more to relativity than just Lorentz boosts, we won't need to know anything else for this video. The other main topic that you need to know about is geometric algebra. You don't need to know much about geometric algebra. What you do need to know is what multivectors are, what the geometric product is, and how geometric algebra describes rotations in both two dimensions and higher dimensions. If you don't know anything about geometric algebra, I made a video introducing exactly these concepts from geometric algebra which should be sufficient for understanding this video. So if you need to, you can watch that video and then you should be good to go here. I'll provide a link to it in the description. So here's a general outline for this video. We will first focus on discovering the algebra. What I mean by this is figuring out what basic algebraic rules we are going to want to use to describe relativity. It's a little different than vanilla geometric algebra, so we're going to want to figure out why we have these differences. Most of this section is going to be covering things like Minkowski space and the spacetime interval with no geometric algebra until the end, so if you've learned those things before, you can skip to the last part of this section if you wish. After doing this, we will look at spacetime splits. The spacetime split is probably the biggest unique contribution that spacetime algebra makes in our understanding and use of special relativity. Finally, we will look in detail at how Lorentz transformations are described in spacetime algebra. While the final results here might be familiar to people who are already quite acquainted with Minkowski space, spacetime algebra makes things much simpler. Now, let's start trying to discover spacetime algebra. However, to do this, we need to figure out why we want spacetime algebra in the first place. To answer this, let's have a brief discussion about symmetry. Think about this square. We say that it's a symmetrical shape, but what do we really mean by that? Well, when we rotate the square by 90 degrees, it looks the same as before. We say that this 90 degree rotation is a symmetry of the square. There are several other symmetries of the square, such as rotating by 180 degrees and flipping the square in various ways. What we see from this is that a symmetry is a transformation that leaves something unchanged. Now this something can be very general. Let's look at a more abstract example that is closer to what I want to talk about. Consider this simple collision of billiard balls. During this collision, the balls followed these paths. But now what if we rotated this whole situation? Of course, the same thing happens, with the balls still following the same rotated paths. Now this might not seem that special to you, but there is actually a very important point to make here. The laws of physics are unchanged by rotations. Notice that I'm not saying that physical situations are unchanged by rotations. In our previous example of a collision, in one situation the ball came from the right, while in the other situation the ball came from the top, so that can't be the case. Instead, I am saying that the laws of physics themselves are unchanged by rotations. While this is a much more abstract example, it is still a symmetry. Thus, we can say that the laws of physics are rotationally symmetric. 
In this context, we often say that the laws of physics are rotationally invariant rather than rotationally symmetric, although it means the same thing. Now going back to special relativity, remember that one of the fundamental postulates of relativity is that the laws of physics are the same in all inertial reference frames. This is another example of a symmetry. More explicitly, the laws of physics are unchanged by a change in reference frame, which is just a Lorentz boost. We often say that the laws of physics are Lorentz invariant. Because Lorentz boosts are an important symmetry in physics, let's look at them in closer detail. Here are the equations for a Lorentz boost along the x-axis. Before we move on, I want to simplify these equations a bit. First off, the top equation uses different units than the rest, so let's make the units consistent. We can do this by multiplying that equation by the speed of light. Now notice that most occurrences of time are multiplied by the speed of light, and if we include the expression for the Lorentz factor, most expressions for the velocity are divided by the speed of light. The only exception to this is the equation for x prime, which we can force into this form by multiplying and dividing by c. In light of this, let's make two new variables that represent time and speed but with this factor of c included. Notice that the letters used for these variables are a slightly different looking t and v. You might think that using similar looking letters is confusing, but the reason for using these letters is that conceptually they represent the same physical quantity, just with different units. Time now has units of length, and speed is dimensionless. By using these new variables, the equations for a Lorentz boost become much simpler. At this point, we can forget about the original definitions of time and speed. I won't be using the old variables anymore for the rest of this video, so things shouldn't be confusing. At this point, you might think that these equations for a Lorentz boost are nice and simple, but there are still several issues. Let's think back to rotations, which are another symmetry of the laws of physics. We can do a rotation with this formula from geometric algebra. In light of this equation, we can start to see where Lorentz boosts are lacking. First, while rotations simply mess with space, Lorentz boosts mix space and time. We normally think of time as a scalar and space as a vector, and having a symmetry that mixes scalars and vectors together is cumbersome. Second, while rotations don't change the length of vectors, Lorentz boosts do. Most of the symmetries of the laws of physics keep vector lengths the same, so Lorentz boosts are much harder to use. Finally, we can do rotations in a coordinate independent way, which makes rotations easy to work with. However, these equations that we have for the Lorentz boost are coordinate dependent. These are the problems that spacetime algebra solves. Let's go through the problems one by one. First, Lorentz boosts mix space and time. This is a problem because most transformations keep objects the same. For example, if you rotate a vector, you'll get another vector. If you translate a vector, you'll get another vector. But if you apply a Lorentz boost to a vector, you'll get a new time, which is a scalar, in addition to a vector. We could add them, but it still produces a different object than what we started with. Since this mix of space and time is unavoidable, let's try something that might seem strange. What if, instead of thinking of time as a scalar, we think of time as a vector? We normally have three basis vectors representing the three spatial directions, so what if we added a fourth basis vector representing time? By thinking of time as a vector, Lorentz boosts would transform vectors to vectors, just like every other symmetry of the laws of physics. This is the first step we need to take towards spacetime algebra. We need to switch from thinking of three-dimensional space to four-dimensional spacetime. Now we need to have a way to distinguish between three-dimensional spatial vectors and these new four-dimensional spacetime vectors, so we're going to need to introduce some new notation. First of all, instead of calling the basis vectors by these names, we usually use the Greek letter gamma with a subscript. This might seem confusing since the Lorentz factor is also called gamma, but notice that these basis vectors use a subscript while the Lorentz factor never uses a subscript. You can blame Dirac for this confusion. Also, while we use the little vector arrow to represent space vectors, we will not use that arrow to represent a vector in spacetime. Now this might cause us to confuse scalars and vectors, so we need to make a further notational convention. Other than the basis vectors in spacetime, every time we see a Greek letter, it will be a scalar.
Note that we will continue to use Latin letters to represent certain scalars that we've already defined, so there can still be some confusion between scalars and vectors in certain situations. Everything should be clear from context, though. Now one issue with having four basis vectors is that true four-dimensional visualization is impossible. However, we can often get away with only visualizing one dimension of space and one dimension of time in a plane. We usually let the horizontal axis be the spatial axis and the vertical axis be the temporal axis. Thus, these two vectors are gamma 0 and gamma 1. In this setting, we can actually get a geometric picture of what a Lorentz boost does. Consider this vector. How will it be affected by a Lorentz boost? Well, with a Lorentz boost at half the speed of light, this is the result. If we play around with the velocity a bit more, we can see that the vector traces out this hyperbola as we apply different Lorentz boosts. The asymptotes for this hyperbola are these diagonal lines. Thus, under Lorentz boosts, this vector is trapped in the upper region of the plane. However, this situation is more general than you might think. Look at how all of these vectors are affected by Lorentz boosts. All of these vectors end up traveling along hyperbolas whose asymptotes are these same diagonal lines. Thus, all vectors in the upper region of the plane stay up there when a Lorentz boost happens. However, this situation is even more general than you might think. Look at how all of these other vectors are affected by Lorentz boosts. All of these vectors end up traveling along hyperbolas whose asymptotes are these same diagonal lines as well. Thus, we see that Lorentz boosts split the plane up into several regions. We have the upper region, which contains vectors pointing roughly towards the future, the lower region, which contains vectors pointing roughly towards the past, and the left and right regions, which contain vectors pointing roughly in a spatial direction. In higher dimensions, these spatial regions are connected to each other, so it's better to think of them as the same region. We call vectors in the top and bottom regions time-like vectors, and we call the vectors in the left and right regions space-like vectors. But what about vectors on the boundary between these two regions? If you were to send a beam of light from the origin, it would travel along this boundary, so we call vectors along the boundary light-like vectors. Anyway, as we can see, by considering time to be a vector, the fact that Lorentz boosts mix space and time is no longer an issue. But now what about our next problem? Lorentz boosts change the length of vectors. While this problem might seem insurmountable, it actually is possible to deal with it as long as we are willing to bend the rules a bit. Before we talk about how to do this, I want to remind you of a fact from geometric algebra. Remember that the square of a vector is simply its length squared. While I have previously stated this as a theorem, in more advanced contexts, we usually consider the geometric product to be more fundamental than the length, and then we define the length of a vector using the square of the vector. Now the square of a vector is pretty easy to find, it's just the sum of the squares of the components. Because the square of a vector is much easier to work with than its length, from now on, let's only consider the square of a vector, not its length. This will make things considerably simpler. The two quantities are easily convertible to each other, so we haven't really lost anything. Anyway, our problem is that when we have a vector, its square changes every time we change our reference frame. However, one thing we do know is that everybody will agree on what the square of the vector is in one particular reference frame. What if we decided to pick one particular reference frame and say that the square of a vector in any reference frame is the square of the vector in that particular reference frame? This would be changing the definition of the square of a vector, but it would trivially cause it to be unchanged by a Lorentz boost. But this directly raises another question. Which reference frame do we pick? To answer this question, we need to look at another way to think about spacetime vectors. The way we usually think about spacetime vectors is as representing an event, specifying the time and place that something happens. But here's another way to think of spacetime vectors. Let's say I was at rest at the origin. As time passes, I would move up in spacetime. The path that I took is this spacetime vector. If I instead started at the origin but was moving to the right at half the speed of light, I would move along this path in spacetime. The path that I took this time is this spacetime vector. What we see is that spacetime vectors correspond to moving at particular constant velocities. 
Because moving at a constant velocity is the definition of a reference frame, vectors in spacetime correspond to reference frames. So going back to finding a reference frame in which to calculate the square of a vector, why not use the reference frame that the vector represents? To be precise, to define the square of this vector, we would do a Lorentz boost to make the vector point straight up, where it represents a reference frame at rest, and then calculate the square of the vector in this reference frame. Everybody agrees on what the square of a vector is in its own reference frame, so by calculating this value we can get a definition for the square of a vector that is unchanged by Lorentz boosts. We can get an exact expression for this definition of the square of a vector with some algebra. In the original reference frame, let's call the vector u. It is some linear combination of gamma 0 and gamma 1. When we calculate a Lorentz boost, t and x are given by these coefficients. Now the square of this vector in the final reference frame is t prime squared plus x prime squared. The reference frame we want to move to is the one where the vector is pointing straight up, which is when x prime is 0. We can now just play with these equations to get a simple expression for the square of the vector. The first thing we can do is put this expression for t prime in the equation for the square. Remember that by definition, gamma squared is 1 over 1 minus v squared. We want to find an expression for this square purely in terms of alpha and beta, so we need to find a way to get rid of v. We can do this with the other equation here. Notice that because gamma can never be zero, it must be the case that beta minus v alpha is zero. This equation can be solved for v to show that v is equal to beta over alpha. We can now use this value of v in the equation for the square. Thankfully, this expression can be considerably simplified. First, the fraction of fractions on the left can be converted into a single fraction. The expression on the right can also be converted to a single fraction. At this point, several terms can be cancelled. We now finally have an expression for the square of a spacetime vector. By design, this value is left unchanged by a change in reference frame. In other sources, this value is often called the spacetime interval. Now one issue here is that this is only for one dimension of space, but it's not too much work to show that for three dimensions, the formula is similar. You might notice that this defines a quadratic form, which is actually all you need to do geometric algebra. This formula for squaring a vector is the fundamental algebraic difference between spacetime algebra and four-dimensional vanilla geometric algebra. To get a feel for how it works, let's see some examples. The square of this vector is 1. Now as we move the vector as if we were doing a Lorentz boost, it still squares to 1, even though to us it might look like the vector is getting longer. If we were to instead move the vector straight to the right, its square would actually decrease. In fact, if we go to the right enough, the vector squares to zero. This is something that is not possible in vanilla geometric algebra. The fact that some non-zero vectors square to zero is a fact that often has to be accounted for. For example, this vector is non-invertible, so it is no longer the case that all non-zero vectors have an inverse. If we continue to move to the right, the vector square becomes negative. This is also not possible in vanilla geometric algebra. A natural question that arises is which vector squared to a positive or negative value. Well, looking at the equation for the square of a spacetime vector, we can see that the square is zero whenever the absolute value of the space coordinate is the same as the absolute value of the time coordinate, so it's any of the vectors along these diagonal lines. Wait a minute. These are just the light-like vectors. Now which vector squared to a positive value? For a vector to square to a positive value, the absolute value of its time coordinate must be greater than the absolute value of its space coordinate. This means that all vectors pointing more vertically squared to a positive value. Hey, again, this is a region we've seen before. These are the time-like vectors. As you might be expecting, the vectors that square to a negative value are the vectors in the left and right regions, which are the space-like vectors. So we now have a much simpler definition of time-like, light-like, and space-like vectors. If a vector squares to a positive value, it's time-like, if it squares to zero, it's light-like, and if it squares to a negative value, it's space-like. Now there might be one thing nagging at you. I earlier said that it's fine to talk about the square of vectors rather than their length because we can easily define the length of a vector as the square root of the square of that vector.
But we've seen now that with this new definition of the square of a vector, this value can be negative. We don't want an imaginary length, and because length should be a scalar, we wouldn't want to pick something else from geometric algebra that squares to a negative value either. There are two possible solutions to this problem. The first option is to just ignore lengths entirely. Most of the things you want to do with the length of a vector, you can do with the vector square. In the situations that you really do want a length, several options exist. However, we won't be needing to define length for this video, so I won't dwell on this point any longer. Anyway, we finally have everything we need to describe spacetime algebra. Spacetime algebra is simply the geometric algebra of spacetime. In vanilla geometric algebra, we start with a vector space given by some orthonormal basis. We then describe the geometric product by saying that the basis vectors anti-commute and that each basis vector squares to 1. Now for spacetime algebra, we will do something similar. We start with our four-dimensional vector space given by the orthonormal basis gamma 0, gamma 1, gamma 2, and gamma 3, where gamma 0 represents time and the others represent space. Once again, we say that these basis vectors anti-commute. The only difference now is that instead of saying that all of our basis vectors square to 1, we will say that gamma 0 squares to 1 while the other gammas square to negative 1. These rules describe how we carry out multiplication in spacetime algebra. In spacetime algebra, multivectors end up having 16 components. One scalar component, four vector components, six bivector components, four trivector components, and one pseudoscalar component. We can also split the basis vectors into the timelike vectors and the spacelike vectors. We can easily extend the definition of timelike and spacelike to the other basis multivectors by saying that anything that squares to a positive value is timelike and anything that squares to a negative value is spacelike. If you want to, it's a nice exercise for getting acquainted with spacetime algebra to figure out which of these are timelike and which are spacelike. In the end, we get three timelike bivectors and three spacelike bivectors, one timelike trivector and three spacelike trivectors, and the pseudoscalar is spacelike. Like usual, we often call the unit pseudoscalar i. The span of these multivectors is what makes up spacetime algebra. Now that we have finally discovered the algebra, we can move on to some of the new things that we can do with it. The main thing we will look at in this regard is the spacetime split which in my opinion is one of the most useful contributions spacetime algebra has made over its alternatives. While I previously introduced spacetime as just thinking of space plus an extra dimension of time, reality is more complicated than this. What is the correspondence between spacetime vectors and space vectors? To answer this, let's think about a vector in one dimensional space. As time passes, it doesn't move anywhere. Thus, if we were to add a second axis for time, as time passes, the vector would sweep out an area in spacetime. Wait a minute, this just looks like a bivector in spacetime. Because this bivector has a temporal component, this is a time-like bivector. So we see that our correspondence between space and spacetime is that a vector in space corresponds to a time-like bivector in spacetime. Now I'll admit that this geometric argument is not that persuasive but hopefully by exploring this idea further, you will see that this is the most natural correspondence between space and spacetime that we can make. Of course, it's nice to think of vectors in spacetime as being related to vectors in space as well. So how could we convert this vector to a bivector? Well, the product of two perpendicular vectors produces a bivector, so we could do this by multiplying this vector by gamma zero. What about a vector that only points in a temporal direction? In space, we usually think of time as a scalar, not a vector. So how could we convert this vector to a scalar? Well, the product of two parallel vectors produces a scalar, so we could once again do this by multiplying this vector by gamma zero. But now what about a vector that has a mix of spatial and temporal components? We should try to split the vector into its spatial and temporal parts and then multiply them both by gamma zero. But wait! Isn't that what the geometric product already does? If we were to multiply this vector by gamma zero, the result would be the sum of the two vectors' inner and outer products. The inner product is precisely the length of the temporal component of the vector, while the outer product is precisely the bivector made from the spatial part of the vector in gamma zero, 
which corresponds to the correct vector in space. What we see here is that to split a spacetime vector into a spatial part and a temporal part, all we have to do is multiply by gamma zero. Then the temporal part is given by the inner product, and the spatial part is given by the outer product. Because we are splitting a spacetime vector into space and time, we call this process a spacetime split. But wait, it gets better! It would seem that the spacetime split is basis dependent because we used one of our basis vectors in the equation. However, recall that time like vectors correspond to reference frames. Gamma zero is simply a plain time like vector, and this split is doing a spacetime split in the gamma zero reference frame. If we replaced gamma zero with another reference frame given by a different normalized vector gamma zero prime, everything works the same way. In doing a spacetime split with a new vector, it will instead split relative to the reference frame given by the new vector, not the old one. This means that we now have a coordinate free way to move from spacetime to any reference frame without even having to use the Lorentz boost equations. But wait, it gets even better! While our focus on the correspondence between time like bivectors in spacetime and vectors in space has been mostly geometric so far, it also works algebraically as well. Think about the four basis vectors in spacetime. When we do a spacetime split with these vectors by multiplying by gamma zero, we associate the resulting scalar with the scalar from space and the resulting bivectors with the vectors from space. But does this correspondence work algebraically? The vectors in space follow certain algebraic rules that are important to using them. Do these bivectors in spacetime also follow these rules? Well, when we square gamma one, gamma zero, we get a minus sign from swapping the two vectors, which then gets cancelled by the minus sign from squaring gamma one. Gamma zero squared is one, so the square of gamma one, gamma zero is one. This is the same as x hat. The same thing happens with the other bivectors in correspondence with space vectors as well. So these bivectors do satisfy this algebraic rule in keeping with the correspondence. Now what about the rule saying that the vectors in space anti-commute? Well, let's try multiplying gamma one, gamma zero with gamma two, gamma zero, and see what happens when we swap them. To swap the two bivectors, we just need to swap the individual vector several times. In the end, we see that the two bivectors do anti-commute as suggested by this correspondence. Once again, the same thing happens with the other bivectors in correspondence with the space vectors. This has shown us that this correspondence between bivectors in spacetime and the vectors in space is not just some geometric trick. It is also reflected algebraically as well. But why stop here? When we multiply the basis vectors of space together, we get bivectors in space. Let's make these products in spacetime as well and associate the bivectors in space with these products in spacetime. After a bit of simplification, we see that we have a correspondence between the space-like bivectors in spacetime with the bivectors in space. We can also find what corresponds with the pseudoscalar in space by multiplying all of the time-like bivectors together and simplifying. So we see that the pseudoscalars in space and in spacetime are the same. The multivector spanned by what's on the left side of the screen forms a subalgebra of the spacetime algebra called the even subalgebra of the spacetime algebra. While I showed that this correspondence keeps the rules for multiplying vectors intact, it turns out that every single possible multiplication is the same on both sides. In more formal terms, this correspondence induces an isomorphism between the even subalgebra of the spacetime algebra and the algebra of physical space. We can also see from this correspondence that spacetime splits don't just split spacetime vectors into spatial and temporal parts. They also split spacetime bivectors into spatial vectors and spatial bivectors, which correspond to the time-like and space-like parts of the original bivector, respectively. Now that we have explored spacetime splits, we can finally move on to understanding Lorentz transformations. To start our discussion on Lorentz transformations, let's go back to the three problems that we had with Lorentz boosts. We have solved the first two problems by using spacetime algebra. However, you might have realized that we haven't solved the third problem yet. So how can we do that? At a first glance, you might think that we've already solved it with spacetime splits. After all, doing a spacetime split splits a vector in the reference frame of the time-like vector being used, so it seems that a Lorentz boost has been done implicitly. The issue is that spacetime splits force us to leave spacetime. What we want is a way to do Lorentz boosts that keeps us in spacetime. Thus, 
we need to look elsewhere for a way to solve this problem. Let's look at Lorentz boosts in more detail in light of spacetime algebra. Once again, here are the equations for a Lorentz boost in one spatial dimension. To express this in the language of spacetime algebra, let's think of a Lorentz boost as a linear transformation that takes a vector and outputs the result of doing a Lorentz boost on it. We can now just use this equation for Lorentz boosts. However, it's still coordinate dependent, so we need to keep looking. When we do a Lorentz boost, we move from one reference frame to another. We usually say that the starting reference frame is gamma zero, but what is our final reference frame in terms of our velocity? Let's say that our velocity was 0 0.5 times the speed of light. This would mean that after traveling one unit up, we have traveled half a unit to the right. In general, this vector here is v times gamma one. The vector representing our final reference frame is just the sum of these two vectors, so it is gamma zero plus v gamma one. Now we usually like our vectors that represent reference frames to be normalized, so let's normalize this vector. Hey look, it's our good friend the Lorentz factor. That makes this expression considerably simpler. Let's call this new vector gamma zero prime. Now when we do the Lorentz boost, we see that gamma zero prime is brought to where gamma zero was. So we see that the Lorentz boost brings gamma zero prime to gamma zero. Thus, what we want is a simpler expression for this linear transformation that brings gamma zero prime to gamma zero. What linear transformations bring gamma zero prime to gamma zero? Well, a simple one is multiplying a vector by gamma zero prime gamma zero. This brings gamma zero prime to gamma zero because gamma zero prime squared is one. But is this linear transformation the same thing as the Lorentz boost? Let's see what the effect of this linear transformation is on an arbitrary vector in two-dimensional spacetime. We can first expand out the definition of gamma zero prime. At this point, we just need to do some simple but tedious algebraic manipulations. We see now that this is precisely the equation for a Lorentz boost. Keeping in mind that this was a generic two-dimensional vector, what we see is that this simple equation represents a two-dimensional Lorentz boost that moves gamma zero prime to gamma zero. Wait a minute. This is exactly the same as the formula for a rotation in two-dimensional space. Does this mean that Lorentz boosts are rotations? Now your first instinct might be to say no, because the effect of a Lorentz boost on the plane looks nothing like a rotation. However, recall the definition of a rotation. A rotation is a linear transformation that preserves lengths and whose determinant is one. Lorentz boosts are linear transformations, we defined length so that Lorentz boosts would preserve length, and you can verify that the determinant of a Lorentz boost is one. Thus, Lorentz boosts are rotations. The reason that they don't look like normal rotations is because of our different definition of length. However, algebraically, they still behave almost exactly the same as any other rotation. For example, with normal rotations, you can represent a rotation with an exponential using a unit by vector i, which can be expanded using Euler's formula. Euler's formula is valid here because the unit by vector squares to negative one. However, in two dimensional spacetime, the unit by vector squares to positive one instead of negative one. Even though it squares to positive one, we can still represent rotations using an exponential. Because i now squares to positive one, when expanding this exponential, we need to use the hyperbolic cosine and sine rather than the trigonometric cosine and sine. As we saw earlier, these rotations cause points to travel along a hyperbola, so we call these rotations hyperbolic rotations. Now one problem with these formulas for Lorentz boosts is that because the two-dimensional rotation formulas don't work for higher dimensional rotations, these formulas for two-dimensional Lorentz boosts don't work for higher dimensional Lorentz boosts as well. How can we calculate Lorentz boosts in higher dimensions? Well, since they're just rotations, we can just use the formulas for n-dimensional rotations. And that's it! We can use these equations to build rotors to perform and compose Lorentz boosts like in any other geometric algebra. Now one important thing to note about Lorentz boosts in higher dimensions is that not all rotations are Lorentz boosts. In general, the different ways you can rotate are given by the bivectors in your algebra. Because our bivector basis has six elements, we have six degrees of freedom for rotations. The three space-like bivectors end up creating normal rotations, not hyperbolic rotations. They create the normal rotations in space.
The three time-like bivectors are the ones that end up creating hyperbolic rotations, which represent the Lorentz boost in the three spatial directions. In a sense, we can think of Lorentz boosts as being rotations through time. So we see that rotations in spacetime include both rotations in space and Lorentz boosts. It is this set of all rotations in spacetime that we call Lorentz transformations. Actually, this isn't quite right. While making this video, I was surprised to learn that we usually allow flips in spacetime in our definition of Lorentz transformations as well as rotations, which makes Lorentz transformations any orthogonal transformation in spacetime. Given that geometric algebra can handle orthogonal transformations easily by using the sandwich product, spacetime algebra is an incredibly useful framework for dealing with Lorentz transformations. Now that we've seen the basics of spacetime algebra, a natural question that arises is what can we do with it? I want to finish this video with briefly showcasing several of the applications of spacetime algebra that I've seen. One application is relativistic mechanics, which is the relativistic version of classical mechanics. Surprisingly, relativistic mechanics looks pretty similar to classical mechanics. A few definitions change, but everything else is pretty much the same. Another application is in electrodynamics. Geometric algebra already makes electrodynamics much simpler, but spacetime algebra makes it even better. Remember that in vanilla geometric algebra, the differential operator and the current are the sum of a scalar and a vector, and the electromagnetic field is the sum of a vector and a bivector. Remember that when we do a spacetime split, spacetime vectors become a scalar plus a vector, and spacetime bivectors become a vector plus a bivector. Thus, in spacetime, these quantities are simply vectors and bivectors. The differential operator is now simply the gradient in spacetime, and the time-like part of the current now explicitly says that charge density is current moving through time. The Lorentz force law is very simple in spacetime algebra as well. Because the dot product of a vector and a bivector corresponds to projecting the vector onto the bivector's plane and then rotating in that plane, we see that the Lorentz force simply rotates moving charged particles in spacetime. The space-like component of the electromagnetic field, the magnetic field, rotates particles in a spatial plane and the time-like component, the electric field, rotates particles in a temporal plane, which we perceive as acceleration. Another application is in relativistic quantum mechanics. It turns out that the Dirac matrices are simply a matrix representation of the basis vectors in spacetime algebra, so by using spacetime algebra we don't need to use the Dirac matrices. Then the Dirac equation can be written like this. David Hestinez has studied this form of the Dirac equation in detail, and it has led to many interesting ideas, including my personal favorite, the zitter bibigong interpretation of quantum mechanics. Finally, some of you may be wondering about general relativity. This has been worked out in the context of spacetime algebra as well. Anthony Lazenby, Chris Doran, and Stephen Gohl have worked out a way to express general relativity in spacetime algebra using gauge theory in a theory called gauge theory gravity. In this theory, instead of gravity being realized as curvature in spacetime, gravity is realized as a gauge field derived from translational and rotational gauge symmetries. Furthermore, some work has been done using gauge theory gravity in quantum mechanics, and I personally think that this is a promising step towards a theory of quantum gravity. For all of these applications, I'll leave several links to textbooks and papers related to them in the description. Whatever it is that you work on, I hope that this video will help you in your future endeavors.